Welcome everyone to SEMJS today. My name is Ian. Uh, can I see a show of hands? Anyone who's first time here at SEMJS? We got one, two, three, four. Nice, nice. Well, welcome. Glad you could make it. Hope to see you again. Uh, we are made up of several people. Um, make that a little bigger. There we go. So these are uh, the organizers of SEMJS. Feel free to come talk to any of us if you have any questions about anything, you want to help out. Uh, Ryan in the back there is an organizer, and then John up front here. Uh, they do a lot of work helping out. You can always send us a note at hello at SEMJS.org, and, uh, and we'll see that. Uh, we have a code of conduct that we expect everyone to follow. Uh, here's just the very first part of it, just kind of like saying that you know, uh, it's a safe place. We don't harass each other. We're respectful. Uh, normal, decent human being stuff. Uh, and we have sponsors, and that's uh, what lets us do the things we do here. We, we wouldn't be able to operate without sponsors. We, had, we would have nowhere to meet, and we'd have no food to give you guys, so nobody would come. Uh, is there anyone here from Barracuda that wants to talk about the company? No? Uh, Barracuda's been a longtime sponsor for us. They're a great company. Uh, they don't always have someone here to talk about Barracuda, but they do some cool stuff with uh, React and some other technologies. Uh, and from what I've heard in the past, they're always looking to hire, so check them out. Uh, we also have Aptive provided the pizza and drinks. Do you want to, Andrew, you want to come up and uh, yeah. say a few words? Yeah, come up on for the, uh, the webcasters can hear you then. All right, awesome. So, we used to be Control Tech. Aptiv acquired us about like two years ago. Uh, we're the industry leader in pre-production data acquisition technologies. So every single car company, when they're building up the cars, they're plugging our hardware and software into vehicles to pull up data and understand how they can improve the performance of them moving forward. We have a large web application that's used by every automotive company, but on React.js and TypeScript, we're located right in Dearborn on Ford's national headquarters and campus. Moving forward, we're going to do a lot of stuff in fleet telematics as well as uh, autonomous vehicle. So a lot of cool stuff going on with my company. We're always going to be hiring and having a lot of girls. So feel free to reach out to me directly if uh, you ever have any interest at any point in time. Yeah, thank you. Yep. <laughs> Andrew mentioned he may take off here, so if you need to get in touch with him, also feel free to hit us up at some, uh, hello at SEMJS or jobs at SEMJS. I'll, I'll show that link later, and then we'll put people in touch with you, too. Yep. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah, I'll stick around for it. All right, cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, also, we have Symphono. provides some uh, time and equipment for John up here to do the, uh, the live cast. Uh, do we have anybody on the live stream right now? Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, if you're not able to attend the, oh, we have one. All right, sweet. Uh, so hi on the web stream. Uh, if you have questions on the web stream, by the way, type those in and, and we'll try to make sure that those get answered. Um, and if you're not able to attend, we do this uh, every time now. Uh, so you can find us, subscribe to our YouTube channel and, uh, and watch along live, get your questions answered. Of course, then the recordings are there uh, if you need to watch it later too. Uh, so we have SEMJS meetups, uh, the main meetings like we are at today, the second Monday of every month. So the date changes, the location changes, but it's always on the second Monday. Uh, and uh, you can check meetup.com to find out sort of details of, of where it is. Uh, next month we're going to have a really cool talk, I'm looking forward to it, about web components with Manuel. And uh, that'll be a, a really good one to... Uh, to catch up on a lot of the changes that were happening there in that spec. Uh, and we're always looking for speakers. We've got a few more spots, um, sort of looking like maybe September, October there might be a spot. And then after that, we might be full until like January of next year. So if you want to, to give a talk, make sure to let us know as soon as you can. Uh, and we can always slot you in somewhere where we have a, an availability. Uh, we do a couple of different kinds of talks. A lot of times we'll do a lightning talk before the main event, which is just a five to ten minute sort of introduction to a subject. It's a real easy way to sort of uh, get up in front of a group of people and practice giving a technical talk. Uh, and uh, it's a great way to sort of ease into it. It's also real fun. It's just easy to do a five minute talk. Um, and, and they can be a lot of fun. 
So if you have ideas of lightning talks you want to give, come talk to me or Ryan in the back. Um, we do these full length talks and we also occasionally do like a half and half talk of like 30 minute talks we pair up together. And that can be kind of fun if, if there's a talk that's uh, not necessarily suited to a full like hour, hour and a half. Um, so lots of different options. Send us a note at speakers at semjs.org or we also have this semjs.netlify.com uh, and a little web form that you can fill out too to make sure we get all the info that we need. We also do a study group uh, every month, and it's the fourth Monday of the month, so it's easy. It's two weeks after this meetup. Uh, it's a much more informal kind of setting. Uh, people just kind of get together and hack on projects or ask questions, get help, give help. Um, it's a much more just sort of a collaborative kind of environment, and that's a lot of fun. I encourage you all to, to try out one of those. Uh, I also like to sort of plug other meetups that are going on in the area. Uh, if, if you run a meetup, by the way, and you're not on this list, like, let me know, and I have no problem throwing people on here. Uh, Rochester Full Stack always meets the day after this meetup, so that's an easy one to remember. Uh, Spencer, do you want to give a talk about that at all? Yeah, hey, uh, my name's Spencer. I'm one of the co-founders of Rochester Full Stack. Uh, we, we will be meeting tomorrow at the Rochester Firehouse. Uh, I will be giving this presentation on building an indie game IDE, which is kind of interesting if you're uh, into video games or building video games. I think you'll enjoy this talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks. Awesome. Uh, I saw there's also a Python users group. I thought that might have a little bit of overlap with this, this group here. Uh, I don't know if there's any members that go to that, but uh, that's something to be aware of this Thursday. Ann Arbor Ruby Brigade as well is coming up. That looks like a really fun talk um, by Colin Fulton, who's another one of our SumJS members. And then uh, Coffee House Coders is uh, every month, and uh, those are very fun too. Are there any other cool events or meetups or anything going on that I missed that people should know about? Yeah. Sure. Um, work is Structure is run by uh, Mario Loria from StockX, um, and that's a monthly event too. I don't remember the exact date of the next one. Um, I think it's usually like the last Wednesday of the month or something like that. Um, but it's like a, a DevOps meetup that happens in Awesome. Yeah? Uh, the tech inclusive coffee and code is on Saturday at noon, I think. Okay. What, what was it? Uh, it's coffee and code, but uh, tech inclusive. Coffee and code, tech inclusive. Tech inclusive also has a talk tomorrow, I think. Okay. Like they have an actual presentation going on tomorrow. That's another good one. Okay. Awesome. Anything else? All right. So I mentioned earlier we have a, a jobs email address. Uh, and this is where uh, we basically put you in touch with our sponsors. So if you are not completely happy with your job that you have now, or maybe you're looking for uh, your first tech job, uh, this is a great way to get introduced to local companies who are looking to hire people like you. Uh, this is how I got my job currently at Nutshell. Uh, they were a sponsor of SemJS, and uh, I was looking for a job, and I reached out, and they did the introductions, and here I am now. Uh, so, and I like to throw this up, I don't know if everyone can read it, but it just kind of says like, not actively looking but open to new opportunities is 60% of the developers that uh, Stack Overflow uh, had surveyed. And uh, only 26% of people were not interested at all in new job opportunities. So there are opportunities out there. Uh, it takes a little bit of work to just send us an email. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard though. And, uh, and we'll send you a list of all of our sponsors, a little description about them. And, uh, and then you decide who you want to get put in contact with. Uh, after the meetup here, we'll be heading to MASH. It's just kind of a, a few blocks away, around the corner, up on 4th uh, and uh, Washington. So uh, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to, to join us if you can, if you've got some time. It's a great time to just uh, relax and talk to each other, network, and uh, find out what people are working on. It's a lot of fun. All right, and our featured talk today, Steve, if you want to come up and uh, get start getting set up. We're going to learn about WebSockets and methods for real-time data streaming. Everyone give Steve a nice warm up. Hello. Can you hear me? Is it good? All right. Awesome. Uh, I am Steve Schwartz. Uh, I have a, 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 consult a consultancy here in town called Alpha Django that acts as a 
CTO and dev team for hire for early stage uh, and mid-stage startups. Uh, I am also the CTO and co-founder of Genomenon, which makes genome interpretation software for diagnosing and treating cancer and other inheritable disease. Um, I've actually given this talk at SimJS before. It was, uh, if you were here last month for the lightning talks, I gave a, a brief introduction, but I was technically the, the second person ever to present at SimJS when it first started. Um, and it was almost exactly six years ago to the day. I thought for the sixth anniversary, it'd be fun to just give the presentation again. Also, it meant I didn't really have to do any work to make a new presentation. Recycling is good. Um, Actually, funny enough, I spent some time today looking through the WebSocket spec and updates from the past six years, thinking, okay, what do I have to change in the presentation? Surprisingly, nothing. The WebSocket spec was officially finalized uh, and added to the HTML5 spec in 2011. I gave the talk in 2013. Basically, nothing has changed. They already built the spec at the time um, to allow for extensibility, and so there are a lot more extensions to the spec, which conveniently are outside the scope of this talk. Um, so yeah, I actually didn't have to change any of the presentation. Um, at the end, though, I'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, give a spoiler to the presentation. I have a fun interactive demo at the end of the presentation. So if you have your laptop or your cell phone or a tablet or anything, if you can connect to the CUDA guest network, then at the end you'll be able to connect over the local Wi-Fi network to my live presentation. Uh, the more people that connect to it, the more fun it will be. I think the fun level will probably increase linearly with the number of people that connect up until the point where my little node server crashes, at which point the fun level will either plummet or skyrocket, depending on what happens when it crashes, I guess. Um, so let's go ahead and get to the presentation. Uh, WebSockets, what are they? Well, WebSocket itself is a protocol that allows for persistent uh, full duplex communication between a browser or a client and the server, meaning you establish the connection once and then both the client and the server can send information to each other asynchronously through that persistent connection. So there's no new handshake required for each bit of information that's sent. Um, how that, gets, how that relates to the HTML5 spec is that the HTML5 spec defines a JavaScript API, this is pre, I think even before ES6 if I remember correctly, um, for the WebSocket protocol within the browser, which allows the bi-directional communication between the browser and the server. It uses uh, TCP, so everything is, is pretty backward compatible with servers that are capable of doing uh, TCP communications and browsers. Um, but why do we need it? Well, because web apps need to communicate with the server in real time and vice versa. Uh, so again, HTTP is based on a request response cycle, which means the browser has to submit an HTTP request to the server for the server to then accept the request and respond. Um, there actually was no way for HTTP connections to stay open once they happened. Um, so the server couldn't actually keep them open up until uh, HTTP version 1.1, uh, which added keep alive. I actually forget how long ago it was. It was, a long, it was well before the first time I gave this presentation six years ago. Um, but there's also a lot of overhead in the actual HTTP connection. So the HTTP request, from the client uh, is sent to the server. The server does the HTTP validation handshake. Um, and then there's also some error checking in the HTTP delivery protocol and uh, validation of the bits that are sent uh, from the client to the server and the server to the client. Um, that allows resending failed bits and whatnot. All of that um, happens pretty quickly if you're on a really fast connection. And so you probably don't notice it most of the time. But uh, if you're on a slow connection, you notice it a lot more. And if you're sending a lot of data constantly, you'll also notice it more because, you know, 1% uh, of the, the, the connection latency times 100 or 500 events starts to actually equal real latency for the user and for the server. Um, so the question then is, well, can't we, al can't we already send information back and forth? And the answer is yes, sort of. Um, so I'm gonna show other ways that you would normally send uh, information back and forth between the client and the browser before we had WebSockets. 
Um, and there was uh, some random person I don't know with the screen name of, uh, I don't know how you pronounce that. If it's German, it'd be Time. Um, it looks kind of German, so I'm just going to go with that. Uh, and he created these um, uh, visuals for an answer to a Stack Overflow uh, post that I thought were really helpful. So uh, the first way would be AJAX polling, which means the client sends an AJAX request to the server. The server responds. Um, and this, you can see uh, the error, this, uh, all the diagrams look like this. So you've got the client making a request to the server, the server responds. The client makes another request, the server responds, and you just keep doing that. The problem is you'll have the overhead of the HTTP handshake happening with each and every request response cycle. Um, so when does this work? It works when the client needs to request data occasionally and when the client needs to send data occasionally. Um, it falls short when the client needs to send data a lot because of the overhead of the HTTP handshake. Um, and it also falls short when the server needs to initiate and send data without a client request because there's no way for the server to do this. Um, so uh, then when they added the keep alive um, to the, the HTTP spec, then you could do long polling as well. So this is where the client sends a request to the server, and then the server will just keep that request open until it has something to respond with. Um, so the way that you do real-time communication back and forth is you would send the request to the server from the client. When the server has something to respond with, it would send it back, which would close the connection, and you'd have your client just instantly send another request that the server could keep open until the next time that it had data to send back to the client. This is a little bit better um, in certain situations than uh, short polling, so it's good when the client needs to request one or a few pieces of data at a time. Um, it also works when the server needs to send one or a few pieces of data occasionally. It falls short, again, when the client needs to send data often, when the client needs to initiate and send data when available, because once the client sends that initial request and then the request is held open, the client then can't send any more data until the server responds and closes and you, you send another request, unless you're you know, just managing a lot of requests uh, concurrently from the client. Um, and it also fails when the server needs to send data often, um, because then those requests aren't going to be very long-lived, and you're essentially going to be right back to what short polling amounts to. Um, server send events. This is starting to get a little bit closer, and this was added uh, and gained popular browser support a little bit before WebSockets, um, which is why it started to take off a little bit. Um, the client opens the connection to the server once, and then the server can s keep that connection open and just keep sending data whenever it needs to. So this is like a half duplex kind of connection. It, it gets rid of the overhead of the HTTP handshake that has to happen with every bit of data sent, since the server doesn't have to close out the connection when it responds. But again, the client can't send, keep sending data since it's only a one-way thing. Um, the ser so this works when the server needs to send data often, and it works when the browser support for WebSockets can't be relied upon. This happened a lot more often uh, six years ago. Now pretty much all the browsers support it. Um, it falls short when the client needs to send any data. Actually, my last startup uh, car code was the one I was working on the last time I gave this presentation. It was acquired uh, five years ago. Um, but we had a lot of real-time communication that was happening in the app there. Um, and what we did at the time was we actually implemented server-side events for the uh, information that the, the server needed to send. And then we would do separate AJAX polling uh, when the client needed to send any information. So it was kind of a hybrid approach back then. So how does WebSocket solve all of this? Well, it opens the connection with the server, just like server send events, except now the client and the server can send each other as much data as they want whenever they need to back and forth. Um, it doesn't have to, it's all asynchronous, so it doesn't have to be like uh, uh, the client sends and then the server sends and then the client sends. They just, they open the connection and they can send each other information at the exact same time, which is why we call it full duplex. Um, 
it's like how a telephone works. Like imagine talking on the telephone, how you can talk to someone while you're hearing them talk. It's hard to tell what, what either of you are saying, but it's possible. Um, so it works when the server and or client needs to send data often. It works when there's browser support uh, that can be relied upon or fallbacks can be used. It falls short when fallbacks can't be relied upon. That's less often now. Um, I will say there's a couple of um, uh, uh, weird edge cases that you still have to deal with, either with server sent events or WebSockets where you have an open uh, connection that stays open. Um, there's some weird things, for example, that mobile browsers do uh, in the name of, of uh, reducing memory and CPU usage, where when the browser tab that you're on leaves the foreground or like you, you know, open your email client or something like that, um, the phone browsers will sort of pause what's happening in the browser, meaning the, the connection isn't live, but it won't end the connection. It kind of like suspends it without notifying the browser or the server that the connection is being suspended. And so sometimes what can happen is you'll have a connection that's open that the server thinks is open and it's sending events, but the phone uh, browser isn't really receiving the events. Um, and it's also not telling the server that it's not receiving the events. So sometimes you can end up with messages you're sending that you think are received that aren't really received, which is why fallbacks uh, in libraries such as Socket.io can still help in that regard because they abstract some of the logic for like acknowledging when information is received, queuing it up on the server side um, when it isn't acknowledged so that it'll resend when the connection is live again or reestablished. Um, so there's still, still some interesting things that happen um, that fallbacks such as Socket.io will help uh, um, abstract. Um, but for the most part, the browsers fully support it these days, and it's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, so what are important components of the WebSocket spec? There's the initial handshake via HTTP, which then requests that the server upgrade the connection from HTTP to WebSocket. Uh, uh, protocol. So this is what the request looks like. You have an HTTP request with an upgrade request asking the server to upgrade the connection to WebSocket. And then you have a response where the server, if it supports it, will send a 101 switching protocols response that upgrades it to a WebSocket connection. Um, so once you have that, now you have a connection that's open between the server and the client um, with full duplex over TCP. So again, it allows bi-directional communication. Um, and this all happens over the standard HTTP ports of 80 and 443 by default. So you get full compatibility with like, you know, a lot of the proxies in the middle uh, uh, from your ISP that, you know, want to inject ads or the government that likes looking at what you're doing. It won't break them. So that's great. Um, the URI structure for WebSockets is, follows the standard URI scheme. So you basically just prepend the protocol with WebSocket WS or WSS. This is like HTTP and HTTPS, so this is the secure version. Other than that, it follows the URI schema. So you have like subdomain, domain, top level domain, you have a path. Um, the only other difference be besides the protocol that's prepended is it doesn't support uh, fragments. Uh, in the URI protocol. So you can't do like, you know, hash and then an anchor tag or something like that. Um, so that's the only part where it doesn't follow URI schema. Um, WebSocket events in JavaScript. So this is in the front end. Again, WebSockets is a protocol for communication between the browser and the server. This is what it looks like on the browser side. You have a connection, a WebSocket connection that just got upgraded from your initial request. Uh, to the WebSocket protocol, and so now you have an on-open event, an on-message event, and an on-close event that you can bind to in your application to update the page however you want. WebSockets are cross-domain by default. Uh, you know, I forgot to actually verify that this is still true. Um, if I had to guess at anything in this presentation that may have changed since six years ago, I'm not positive it's still cross-domain dom by default. It might now not be the default, um, but at least at the time, uh, you can then optionally restrict domain access via the origin header response uh, in your server's response. Um, this is what one of those would look like, a request that's coming from this origin, and then your response, you can uh, restrict your domain to only allow that origin, so then it would the browser would cut it off if the origin didn't match the server's uh, header there. Um, and like I said earlier, the WebSocket protocol was built with extensibility in mind. 
Um, so at the time, uh, some of the current extensions included uh, per frame deflate. So that's actually an extension to the WebSocket protocol that allows um, uh, in transit uh, uh, compression and deflation, uh, like via gzip or something like that, so that you can compress the data that you're sending through your WebSocket connection. Multiplexing is also pretty interesting. So the multiplexing extension um, is from the fact that like, if you have a web application and your server is handling a bunch of connections at the same time, it's handling each WebSocket connection as a totally separate thing, when in reality it could be sharing the overhead of the, the underlying, um, I don't know, like serialization, deserialization kind of logic that are built into the library um, to save on performance. The easier thing to imagine, though, is the use case for multiplexing on the front end, where a user could have three tabs of your application open, and each tab would have its own uh, uh, WebSocket connection. Um, and so this extension would allow all three tabs to share a single connection and send dif uh, information over different channels through the same connection um, so that you don't then have the overhead of maintaining multiple uh, parallel WebSocket connections in the browser. Um, and I actually had, this is an example of how you would establish from the client side, how you would establish a new WebSocket connection using extensions. You just pass them through as a second parameter. Um, and I have a link here to other sub protocols. If I remember correctly, at the time there were like maybe 10 or 15. I just checked this today and there's like 100. Um, so that there's definitely a lot more extensions now. Uh, message data types. Original WebSocket spec allowed for strings. By the way, I'm trying to fly through this so we have more time for the demos at the end. So uh, I apologize if I'm going quickly. Uh, I just want to get to the fun part. So message data types. Original WebSocket spec only allowed for strings. Uh, now and by now, I mean 2013. Uh, it also allows for buffered arrays and blobs. Here's a couple examples. Sending a string is pretty straightforward. Connection.send, and you send a string. Uh, uh, sending an array buffer. Um, this is an example of sending an image, sending image data through a buffered array. Um, you don't really have to look through this, I guess, but you can see I'm creating a, a, an eight byte integer whatever array, or uh, is that Unicode? Right, something like that, and then I'm just literally sending the binary data of the uh, the image to the server, and then sending a blob. Um, this is an example where you're pulling a file that the user has selected through a, a file field in a form, and you can literally just send the file over WebSockets as well. Um, and then this is just a brain dump of some random stuff that you would see in a real world uh, deployment of WebSockets in a production application. This is actually from the websocket.org website of a typical uh, uh, infrastructure. You have a bunch of browsers that connect to your WebSocket server or gateway through the internet. And what you could have is you could have a bunch of different services in your service oriented architecture that have a lot of different events that they're sending to your WebSocket gateway that can then fan those events out to the proper clients. Um, sending JSON is a really obvious use case of WebSockets. Um, why would you send a string when you can send a structured string like JSON? Um, it doesn't support that natively. There may be an extension for that by now. I, I wouldn't see why there wouldn't be. But it's also not totally necessary because on the client side, or on the either one, you can stringify JSON. So you can take a JSON object, turn it into a string. And then on the other side, you can take a string and parse it as JSON. So it's actually pretty easy in this case to say, OK, here's my JSON object. Let me stringify it and send it. And then on your client side, you can just parse the data that it receives. Um, and now you effectively are sending JSON through uh, WebSockets. So uh, another random bit of information is it's meant as a browser to server protocol. It's not meant for browser to browse, or I'm sorry, server to server. In that case, you're probably better off using UDP or some other protocol that's intended for server to server communication. Um, it's also not intended for browser to browser communication. That's what WebRTC is for. Um, and here's another note on proxies. So the proxies I mentioned were, you know, your ISP likes to inject their ads into your insecure HTML and whatnot. Um, proxies through the internet, so everything from your computer, your laptop, 
to the uh, uh, server that you're accessing. You know, your request is going through your ISP and then it's going through various edge proxies. Those proxies do weird things like uh, caching certain data uh, at different proxy locations so that it doesn't have to send you things that other people uh, near you are also requesting. Um, and so they try to do all these clever things like caching data and injecting ads and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of those proxies though, those servers don't know how to upgrade a request to WebSockets. And so what ends up happening is your browser supports WebSockets and your server supports WebSockets. And then you try to load your application and the WebSockets don't work because some random proxy in the middle is doing something it's not supposed to and it doesn't know how to upgrade a request to WebSockets. So in production, you pretty much always want to use secure WebSockets. I mean, you do anyway, because you know why not? Um, but the other advantage that you get from using secure WebSockets is that it causes the, uh, since it's secure and encrypted, it means all the proxy servers have to just proxy the information to and allow the information to tunnel through them transparently since they can't do anything with encrypted data anyway. And so it actually causes the proxy servers to not break your WebSocket implementation by using secure WebSockets. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, your server must support WebSockets. Um, this is actually, again, really common. There's already modules out of the box for Nginx and Apache and whatever servers. Heroku now supports WebSockets. At the time that I originally did this six years ago, Heroku did not support WebSockets. So if you use something like Socket.io, which would detect support on both the browser, the client, and the server, and then uh, fall back to like you know some under the hood uh, short polling fallback or something like that. Um, so you could deploy to Heroku and then Socket.io would just, in production, it would fall back to short polling. Um, but Heroku actually supports it now, um, and a lot of other servers support WebSockets. Um, so it's much easier to just implement straight up now. Um, and of course, your backend application must also know what to do with WebSocket data. So uh, your, your application must know how to receive and send asynchronous data. Um, but this exists in pretty much any of the major languages. Um, Node.js obviously is asynchronous by default. Ruby has uh, libraries like Event Machine that are basically an asynchronous server. Pretty much any language that supports event loops can support WebSockets. And so there's already libraries for a lot of these, Node, Ruby, Python, PHP. Um, there's also a list of libraries on Wikipedia. Um, and your browser must support WebSocket. Pretty much all of them support it. Now, at the time, I, I said the, um, if anyone remembers six years ago, Android had an Android browser that wasn't Chrome, it wasn't mobile Chrome, and then they released mobile Chrome, and so there were a couple years where they had them side by side, so like, if you upgraded your OS, then you got mobile Chrome, if you didn't, you're still on uh, Android. Well, actually, this doesn't even apply anymore because Android browser 4.4 added support as well, so this is even supported on that. Um, again, Socket.io is awesome, probably more so at the time when you couldn't always rely on full support on the client or the server. Um, now it's, it's pretty much supported everywhere. Socket.io is still nice because, like I said, they abstract some of the things like uh, message acknowledgement and queuing up messages to resend when they haven't been acknowledged and that sort of thing. Um, and some example real world uses, real time chat application, multiplayer HTML5 game, event based in page analytics are another thing. So, uh, you know, if you're using something like a JavaScript based analytics, you can do it with much less overhead. Um, and of course, many other things. Um, this, how are we doing on time? Cool, we're actually doing pretty well. So at this point, I was actually gonna do a bit of live coding just to illustrate how easy and simple WebSockets is, uh, even if you're just coding it plain. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'll code up a quick Node.js server using nothing but what's included in uh, uh, the standard lib of Node.js, and then on a quick HTML page using nothing but vanilla JS. Um, so let's make this bigger. And uh, six years ago, I did this entirely from memory I will try to do it again, but I do have a, a cheat page um, that I can flip over to if I forget. So, um, let's see, do we wanna start with, I, I just have boilerplate HTML here so you guys don't have to watch me code you know, meta tags and stuff. 
Um, but this is just, it's plain HTML over here, and this is just a plain JavaScript Node.js file that will run with Node over here. Um, let's start with Node. Okay, so let's do, uh, what we're gonna do here is we're going to require the uh, WebSocket, see I'm already forgetting, WebSocket uh, library here. We are going to make our server equal new WS, uh, and we're going to tell it to run on a port that's not being used, like 8080. Um, and then on our server, since we can have multiple uh, WebSocket connections being established to the server at the same time, what I want to do is create a global object to keep all of those connections organized so that I know how to access them. So uh, I'm going to create a global thing, object here called all clients, and then I'm also going to create uh, a counter, um, which I'm gonna use to increment the, the unique IDs that I assign to each connection. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to say um, server dot on uh, connection uh, function, we'll call it websock. Uh, what gets passed into the connection event. So this happens when a new WebSocket connection is sent to the server. Um, and what we are going to do here is we're going to implement our counter. We are going to assign the WebSock uh, object that's passed through to it, the ID of the counter. And we're also going to add this for uh, uh, easy um, interaction to our global object here. So we'll uh, assign the key as the ID that we just gave it, and the value will be the WebSock object itself. Let's also do some logging uh, so that we can see it working when we see the server running from the command line. Um, now that we have that, uh, what we need to do, so now we have a WebSocket connection that was just established in the server, and so what we wanna do is we wanna listen to its message event. Um, which will pass in its message. And then we'll also want to listen to its close event so that we can uh, delete the connection um, from our global object. So on this event, we'll say all client, uh, we'll say delete all clients websock.id. And up here, uh, what I'm gonna do in this really simple app is I'm gonna take every event that's received by a WebSocket connection and I'm gonna send it to every other WebSocket connection that's uh, connected to the server. And so what I wanna do here is for let client in all clients, we are going to do all clients um, client.send um, message. And actually, I want all clients to know who's sending the message, so I'm gonna send it a string that is, um, that tells everyone who the, the connection ID is that's sending the message. So this will send all clients the ID of the WebSocket connection and the message that it sent. And let's see, we have something that is not closed here. Ah my for loop. Okay, so that's the server. That's literally all I'm gonna do. So I have something listening. What's that? Where are we at here? Yes, you are correct, thank you. Yep. There we go. Okay, so hopefully that'll work. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, now up here in the body, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give myself a div that I can um, add data to. And then a script tag. Like I said, I'm just doing some vanilla JavaScript, so I'm not trying to get fancy in here or anything like that. So let ws equal new web socket. And now I have to give it the, uh, I'm just gonna do regular web sockets here because we don't have to, we're on the local Wi-Fi, we don't have to worry about proxies and I haven't tested it with the secure one yet uh, on this demo. So um, I don't know what my local IP is yet. So let's leave that blank for the moment, but I do know that I said, told the server to listen on port 8080. So we're gonna do that. And then let's do our document dot uh, query selector. Okay, and that's my div. 
And so now what I'm going to do is I need to listen. WS dot, um, the, the API on the client side isn't quite as nice on the, as the one in Node where we have the on event and we just pass it our message. We actually have uh, the direct message listeners over here on the client side. So this one is called um, on open. Uh, and here we're going to say um, stuff dot inner text equals connected. And then, and then we also have the on message, I believe. This is where we're getting in the part I can't totally remember all the um, syntax and or um, function names. On message, and so what we want to do here, or no, actually what's passed in here is E, uh, the event itself. And then what we want to do is say stuff.innerText equals, we're going to append it. You become really bad at typing when you're doing it in front of a lot of people. OK, so I think I got this right. Stuff.intertext equals whatever was already in intertext, new line, and then whatever data was just sent by the server. And then the other thing I want to do is I'm going to attach it. This is bad JavaScript, guys, so, uh, everyone, so don't, don't do this. But um, I'm just going to create, I'm just going to attach it to my uh, global window uh, object so that I can get to it from the console. So I have this going now. So what I'm going to do over here in the console now is I'm going to figure out what my local network is. Um, it looks like 172.28.30. I'm going to paste this here. And then I'm literally just going to open, I'm going to open the, the page. And we're going to see if this works. It might not. All right, on open. See, I knew I forgot. Let me open my cheat. Uh, page over here. It is called uh, on open on message new WebSocket blah blah blah. What's that? Oh, yep, you are right. Thank you. That is how you do it. Glad I had that page saved. That would have probably taken too long to figure out. There we go. So connected. So what I'm going to do now, actually, is I'm just going to open another one here. I'm going to, uh, let's see, I should have window.ws.send. Hi. And we should see it over here. And now I'm going to do the same thing over here. Window.ws.send. Hey. And so, so that is WebSockets working uh, using vanilla JavaScript. So now let's go to the fun demo. So this is a, a demo that I actually took some time to create. Um, and this is the one that everyone will be able to connect to um, from their local device. So I'm going to say, all right. Good. All right, so if you have your computer or your phone or tablet or whatever and you're on the local Wi-Fi, if you go to 172.28.2.30 colon 3000, you'll be connected to the same page. My page is going to update via WebSockets. Um, and I built this demo with modularity in mind. So uh, this is an open source project that anyone can go to. You can create new modules. So basically what I did was I created a general purpose application um, that provides a couple really simple APIs uh, for uh, uh, developing your own modules that you can then install. And what those modules do is they can send data via WebSockets and receive data via WebSockets and then do whatever they want with the uh, application itself. I have a couple modules that I built. So uh, the modules I have here are connection uh, and connected and closed.js, which handle adding, uh, basically adding event data to this uh, pane at the top that tells you when people are connected and when they leave. 
And then I have a couple other interesting ones like click.js. So I don't know who these numbers are, but I am one. That's why it's green. And there we go. I can click three, and you can see a click event was sent to client three. So whoever is client three should see a message saying click receive from client one. Who, who's client three? All right, Mike. All right. So did you get it? All right. Uh, the other thing I have, the other module I have installed here is one I created called Follow.js. Now, Follow.js is interesting because I built it specifically to be stupidly inefficient. So what ClickJS does is when you click your own square, it activates follow mode. And then as you move your cursor around, your square follows your cursor. And it does the same thing on everyone else's computer. So everyone else is seeing my number one square moving around right now. The way that it does this is my, my follow.js module, it literally has an event that fires on the mouse move event, which anyone who's ever used that knows happens many, many times per second as you move your cursor. And it's an event that fires with the current x and y coordinates of your cursor on the page. And so what follow.js does is it listens to that event and as it receives that event from you, it then fans your x and y coordinates out to everyone else. And everyone else's follow.js module is listening for everyone else's follow.js events and just updating those squares with the current x and y coordinates. So you can see this, the, my square animating, moving across the screen. This is not being done with any sort of animation library or telling it to move to a certain point. It's literally being done with each frame of JavaScript updating the DOM with the new x and y coordinates, and you do it enough, and it looks like the thing is moving. This is very inefficient, and yet everyone can do it because WebSockets are, are so efficient themselves, and it kind of works. Um, I actually created another module today just for this one that I thought would be pretty fun. Um, last month, one of the lightning talks we had was from Spencer. Is Spencer here? All right. Uh, you talked about the web audio. Yeah. API. So I built a module today, which basically it's called sound.js. So you can see uh, if it's one of my installed modules here. And so what this does is if you're on a computer and you hit the space bar, or if you're on a mobile device and you click this speaker icon down in the like far lower left corner, every time you click it, it sends a sound. It enables your web audio API, and it sends a sound event. And what the module does when it receives a sound event on everyone else's computer is it basically uh, uh, tallies a running three second average of how many events it's received in the past three seconds and then emits a tone uh, and updates the frequency of the tone based on how many events it's gotten in the past three seconds. So I'm going to turn mine up here. Um, let's see if this works. So the faster I click space, the higher the tone gets. Um, earlier today, I was able to get it up to around 800 hertz. Uh, if a lot of people are doing it, theoretically, you can get much higher than 800 hertz. Um, I'm not totally sure. I don't know. Can everyone else start clicking? Yes. So you can make it get very annoying. Um, actually, one other thing I found interesting was if you open another tab, they start uh, interacting with each other. I don't know if it's going to do it this time if I enable it. Uh, so what was happening? No, I may have actually inadvertently fixed it. when. I, so initially, it wasn't a three-second running average. It was just the current click and the last click. And what I found out was even with two people doing it, if you happen to click spacebar right when they did, it created a really high, it would like shoot up to like 15,000 hertz. Um, and so that's when I implemented the rolling average, which I think got rid of the side effect I found earlier, which was if you had two tabs open, because they were always calculating the current click from the last one, if you started the second tab after the first one, then they weren't working from the same reference point. And you would get two different tones coming from two different tabs, and they would interact with each other the way sine waves do. So uh, uh, I would get like a woo, 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 like really interesting kind of thing. But Anyway, uh, that's another really stupid and efficient thing you can do with WebSockets because WebSockets themselves 
are efficient. So uh, that is my presentation. <laughs> Questions? Sure. Are there tricks to running websites if you have a load balancer and they're needing to like maintain a connection to a particular client? Like how do you do that if something's coming in and out? That is actually a really great great question that I don't know the answer to. Um, as much as I've played with WebSockets, I have not actually built them into a production application yet. Um, actually, the application that we have for Genomenon called Mastermind um, is a very um, interactive application. It uses Angular. There'd, there'd be a lot of stuff that would be really good for WebSockets there. So we do have a ticket for converting it over to WebSockets. In the past four years, we've never gotten to that ticket. Um, so I actually don't know. That's a really good question. Why sticky IPs where you want it to go to the same IP address every Yeah, well, time. since it is a connection, if I had to guess, since it is a connection that stays open, when the request is made, your load balancer is going to send it to whatever server it sends it to. Once the connection is made, it's going to stay open. So you probably wouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, dealing with the um, it going across servers or anything like that. Actually, you know what? I take that back. I implemented, uh, like I said, car code used server send events which had the same issue, even though it was only sending data one way. It did have the same issue. That was a production app. And it, it, was, uh, it, it did have an insane amount of, of concurrent traffic at any given time. Um, that you can configure to hit the same IP address. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it actually just all happened transparently since the connection stayed open. Um, we also assigned, if I remember correctly, this was years ago, but if I remember correctly, you know, we obviously didn't do uh, um, the, when we assigned a WebSocket an ID, we obviously didn't do it by incrementing an integer. We did it with UUIDs. And so you could also cache the UUIDs and the servers they were on in like a memcache instance or, or Redis or something like that. And you could have sort of a shared state across everything that knew where things were. Um, Again, I don't think we had to do that, if I remember correctly, because the connection would just stay open. Um, and if it established a new connect, we were also persisting the messages that we were sending in a database. And so if the client had to establish a new connection and it got sent to a new server, um, we knew the information like who the user was, um, which we would tie with the WebSocket connection when we stored the state in the, the shared database. And so we could, the new connection could always see where the old connection left off. And so we didn't really have the issue of, of worrying about connections that change from server to server, since the first thing that happened on a new connection was it checked the database for that user to see like what was the last event and do I need to send it again? Yeah. Yes? How would you authenticate? Are there like headers on the initial HTTP request? Yeah, so you would do authentication the same way that you always do. Because it's over the HTTP protocol, your WebSocket connection, uh, the data that's sent is with your cookie, I believe. Or no, that's actually not true. I'm starting. I apologize. Most of this information I have is from six years ago, so I'm kind of remembering it as you ask it, too. Um, I believe the way that we did it is on the initial connection, because it's HTTP, the initial connection does send the cookies with it. I don't remember if the, I don't think the WebSocket data sends those cookies with it, because those happen, um, I didn't talk about this, but if you open the console and you go to a uh, network, um, there is a tab for WebSockets. And through this tab, you can see, oh, I guess I have to reload the page, OK. So through this tab, you can see data usually. I don't know why you can't see the data. I'm wondering, huh? Uh, it's, you know what's also possible? I don't have any filter on. I think my demo is using socket IO, so this might be falling back to Ajax requests. Um, my plain one, you should be able to see it because we just directly implemented web sockets. Yeah, that's not what I want. Um, I go here and I do the other server. Oh, that's weird. Now it's not working. Um, 
Anyway, what you would be able to see here is the individual frames. So WebSocket sends data parsed across frames, and you'd be able to see the individual frames with the bytes that are in them. And so that's what the WebSocket protocol gives you, is it gives you the ability to abstract that by sending strings, binary blobs, or buffered arrays. And each side just sees that data when it's assembled. The actual way that the data is transferred via WebSockets is through individual frames with literal bytes in the frames. Um, that get reassembled, so they get split apart on the side that's sending and then reassembled on the side that receives them. So because of that, I don't think it's sending the cookie data because that would be a lot of unnecessary uh, frames to be constantly sending and that kind of defeats the purpose of not having the overhead of the handshake going on. So if I remember correctly, the way that we dealt with that was the initial connection is HTTP that asks for an upgrade to WebSockets. And so what you do on your server side is you get the cookie that's sent with the initial request. And from that, you can see you know, what their, the user is that's authenticated. And if they're not authenticated, you can just send them to the authentication form and do all that outside of WebSockets. When they are authenticated, you store the user on the server side with the WebSocket ID identifier. And so then you know this WebSocket connection is for this user that you figured out was authenticated in the initial HTTP request. And so that's, I believe, how we handled it, if I remember correctly. Did you ever configure the frame size, or did you ever concern yourself with the frame size? I never did. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing you can do or not. I'm sure you can do that in the extensions. I want to say the frame size is fixed. Never comes up, never comes yeah, up. it's never come up. I want to say that might be part of the spec is a fixed frame size. So whatever data you have just gets split across however many frames there are. But I don't remember for sure. Yes? Um, I guess I have a question about like how do you scale WebSockets past the point. So say you're overloading your server, mm -hmm. you can't handle that many events, um, and if you spend, have to spin up another one, how would you make those servers? Because that would be in sync, right? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's kind of getting, I think, to Ian's point. So the, the idea would be that you'd have multiple servers that are all handling the WebSocket connections, and the requests are being made through a load balancer that's deciding how to fan out those requests. Um, as long as you have sort of like a central state that's storing you know, all of your connections and knows what's open and what needs to be sent, um, you would do that in like a local database or Redis or Memcache or something like that, that all of your concurrent servers share a connection to. Um, and so it would basically just be the same way that you share um, uh, HTTP state across different servers as well, where you know typically you have someone who's logged in, so when they make a request from their browser, it's sent with the cookie, your load balancer. You might, you know, a user might load the home page and then click a link. The home page request might have went to server A, and when they click the link, it might have went to server B. You have their session shared on your server, like you know how to to access the session from the cookie that's sent in the request header. And so your servers, the fact that one request went to server A and one request went to server B is kind of abstracted from their shared state. And the same would be true with WebSocket. So on the back end, you would just have a shared state, whether that's a, a database or, or you know, a global instance of memcache or something like that that everything connects to. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> I forgot to mention this at the beginning. If you can think of